What's up, everybody? It's Taylor Soper from GeekWire. We're here with Dave Pinocchio, CEO and co-founder of Bleacher Report. Uh, we're at CES in Las Vegas. Uh, your first time here, or you've been here many times? Uh, this is my first time for work here. My, uh, my attempt to keep a separation of church and state with Vegas and work just uh, fell on its face. So, <laughs> yep, first time at CES. Uh, today's the first day that the show floor is open. Any first impressions? I mean, it's kind of a circus. There are an amazing amount of people here who have, an, and just the, the array of things that are covered at CES these days is absolutely incredible. Um, I have no idea, you know, 99% of the stuff going on here right now, but um, yes, it's a circus. Very good. Um, so Bleacher Report, how do you describe Bleacher Report? I mean, you founded the company several years ago, but today, how do you, when someone asks you, or maybe, you know, an old, like your mom or someone says, what, what's Bleacher Report? How do you describe it? Yeah, we're the sports brand of the younger generation. Um, we are, we're trying to build something that's lasting for, you know, not, not five years, not 10 years, but 30, 40, 50 years. Um, we are, uh, we are and have very much become the, the social voice of sports in the United States and more and more globally. Um, we're just trying to do a better and better job making consumers happier, especially younger consumers, every day. So it's coming along. And as you compare yourself to other sites, whether it's legacy media or newer newer folks like you, how do you how do you compete? And like, what's what's Bleacher Report's secret sauce? Is it the the social aspect of it? Is it the the editorial content? Like, what's the secret sauce there? I mean, I think voice and brand is at the end of the day what differentiates most. Um, a lot of the most talented people at Bleacher Report are actually of the culture that we're we're covering. The sports is so much more than what happens on the court now. It's um, it, it's the culture and it's the lifestyle that that surrounds um, the athletes athletes and the, the teams and um, and the fans and it's just the scope of what sports means it's just so much broader than it used to be so I think having so many people that are actually of that culture and and are, are younger and incredibly talented and are using new technologies and mediums and like are you know use snapchat themselves versus um, some other places you might have people who are kind of observing the culture from the outside but they're not in the middle of it so to me it's hard to be as authentic and just kind of real to an audience if um, if you're kind of always an outsider. So that's really, really important to us that we're, we're really of the culture that we're covering and serving because it allows us to have more of a direct kind of one-to-one -one honest relationship with them versus the facade of kind of like, hey, we're talking down to you and we're telling you what's important. It's like, nope, we're all in this together. We're going to put some polish around it. But at the end of the day, you can trust us and you know that if we put something in front of you, it's something that you're very likely to like enough that you're going to share it with your, your friends. And that's the ultimate standard, right? Has that been the, the, the ethos and core of Bleach Report since day one? I mean, you guys have been through a lot of changes, um, you know, went through an acquisition by Turner, who's here hosting this event. Yeah. How much, and uh, yeah, I guess the original question is, how, has that been always the mission? And if not, has it changed? Our, so, started the company very much to, uh, to build an experience that served young sports fans. Started the company, was finishing college, um, looked around, saw that most of the traditional players um, we're focused, it seemed to me, on, on older audiences and basically what my generation and what the generations that are even younger want now is just, it's different. Um, the world's become more fragmented. What, what you expect um, as, a, as an 18-year-old sports fan is just really, really different than what a 60-year-old sports fan expects. It's not, a, it's not a bad thing, but it just means that at the time there was room uh, for this experience that was probably more personalized, probably more social in nature maybe celebrated sports a little bit more, was less serious at times, um, that just didn't exist. And so that's, th that has been consistent in terms of what we have been trying to build and kind of like our core ethos. The ways we've got there and the way, what, what we've had to do to build a media company with no money is, you know, uh, kind of these nobody kids that nobody took that seriously. We've, um, we've invented different distribution models you know, to the sun and back and done all these crazy things, but it's it's always been to to build something that's lasting and meaningful to a younger generation of sports fans. You mentioned money, and that's obviously a big topic now in 2017 with media companies. Just yesterday, Medium said they're going to cut half, you know, a third of their staff. Yes, um, but on the on the surface, they've increased their posts, they've increased traffic, but they just can't make the money. Yes. So how about how have you thought about advertising and the revenue model? Um, how does Bleacher Report approach that? Yeah. I mean, I think for starters, every advertising category is different, so it's, it's hard to compare Medium to Bleacher Report or to other. We could, um, I mean, sports is a great advertising category because uh, a couple of reasons. Um, 
through sports, you can reach just a disproportionate amount of men in the United States. Um, you also, if you look at, um, at the numbers kind of one layer deeper, the only only content vertical that men share con content about consistently is sports. Yeah. Women share content about lots of different things. Men, it's just sports. <coughs> Excuse me. So I think that our position just in the advertising space is quite a bit more stable as a result. Mm -hmm. And what we've been able to do so successfully is because we have such incredible traction on social with the younger audience, we have amazing scale, amazing engagement. Our engagement rates are sometimes 10 times higher than like really our our big competitors, I mean, we're talking about like thousand percent differences. Um, advertisers are seeing the value in being able to connect with our audience because our we just have enough influence at this point because of the trust we've built where we can actually shape the behavior of consumers. And that's a two-way street. Like we have a responsibility not to put stuff in front of consumers that um, that isn't good for them or that they're ultimately gonna throw up on. We're trying to put services in front of them that are gonna make their lives better, or put products in front of them that they really like and brands that they, they enjoy and wanna celebrate. So well, that, that's hard as we continue to scale our revenue as, as we are and doing more branded content, branded entertainment and integrating more brands into, into social and the things we need to do to grow revenue. Um, but it does come with a greater responsibility to make sure that that content is just as good as content that doesn't feature brands. Um, but I'm pretty happy with where we are so far and, and we're, uh, we're in a good spot. And we talk, as we talk about online content and advertising and streaming and you mentioned social and apps and personalization, I mean, technology kind of has a touch point on all of those things. So yeah. how do you guys approach tech? I mean, are you looking at the newest and latest stuff every day? Are you um, prioritizing newer technology? Like, How does tech impact the company? It, it impacts the company hugely. We have a 60-person tech team that's um, pretty much based in San Francisco. So it's like our, our company started in San Francisco. Um, a, almost half our staff is still in San Francisco. As we've become more of a media company, we uh, we've gravitated towards New York, where more most of our content people are in New York these days. Um, I still have a very open attitude around using new technologies, and we you, the bigger you get, the harder that is to do because there's more risk, and you can it it is. Um, there's this kind of you know Apple paradigm where you have to ship so much product to so many people that the cost of being wrong is really really expensive. But there are great new technologies out there. Um, we uh, we made a big bet on Elixir, for example, um, when we rebuilt our programming tools last year. Uh, that's gone incredibly well for us. It was uh, it was not a a decision that was made casually and without great debate. Um, but but we did it. We've iterated. Um, and I think that's why we've been able to uh, to maintain such a great group of engineers and product people because we are willing to take chances and we're like we're here to evolve over like Turner and Bleach Report collectively in our partnership. We're looking at this over a 10 to 20 year horizon. Um, we're trying to build something again that that matters to people their entire lives. So we have to take that attitude. It can't just be about like hey let's do this you know because in 2017 it's the safe thing to do. Um, so our technology will continue to change. The number like our app strategy will continue to evolve. We're going to do some really cool things with our app um, this this year especially, and uh, and I expect that that'll be our attitude going forward at least as long as I'm here. That's a lot of fun, and it's cool to hear you talk about not just the next couple of years, but five, ten, twenty years ahead. I mean, it's been such a journey for you already. I know. Um, you guys had some some rocky times in the beginning, and you were saying you're a bunch of no, like, a bunch of kids just starting a company. Yeah, so, sure. when you look back on it, I mean, what what do you take away? Like, what lessons the other entrepreneurs that maybe want to do something similar to you? Like, what do you tell them, and what advice would you give? I mean, it's a it's a hell of a thing. First of all, if um, yeah, if you if you go and try to do something like this, I think you need to be a little bit crazy for for starters. Um, but you know, crazy like a fox, kind of. But that I'd say the you know the number one thing for us is. It was just perseverance. Um, there, there's so many highs and lows, and really, there's so many crappy days. You wake up and you think the sky is falling, and you, when I say crazy, you kind of have to have this blind attitude that's like, I'm going to pick myself back up, I'm going to fight, and we're going to get to kind of that that point where it's okay. And you know, they're not all okay. Most startups don't work, but if if you believe in your vision and yourself and your team and the market opportunity and the product. That's what you have to do, and it's not like all these, you know, incredibly successful entrepreneurs who made it big and created these things that changed the world. It's not like they started from any different place. So the odds of success are low, but if if you believe, um, just make sure that you have that attitude where it's like, don't get too high, don't get too low, pick yourself back up, go for it. <laughs>
<laughs> well, thanks, Dave, for taking the time, and uh, we're looking forward to seeing what Bleach Report has in store for the future. Thank you.